No questions? Are y'all just like crawling to the finish line here? Yeah. Hands and knees, elbows, drag, drag. All right, pretty much everything I'm gonna cover today is, is, uh, is designed to be somewhat of an overlap into Cal 2, um, just so that when you get there, it's not brand new. But there are some schools, if you go to a Cal 2 class from here, that will assume you've seen this and will pick up right, like you, there may not, may not be any overlap, so just FYI. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna be talking about Four, seven, antiderivatives. We talked about this last time, right? A little bit? A little bit. And we, we were talking about that an antiderivative was, was the reverse process for taking a derivative, you know, starting with something and going back to where it came from. So we have a more formal way of writing this down, all right? We say, given, ooh, it's a good marker. Nice, nice marker, okay. Given f of x, we call any function capital F of x, an antiderivative of little f if the following is true. The derivative of capital F of x is equal to little f of x. So this is what it means to be an antiderivative. So for example, if we're given a little function f of x is equal to x squared, any function that we can come up with that when we take the derivative of it, we get that is called an antiderivative. So some examples of a capital F would be, well, yeah, I guess we'll stick with this. We, talk, we did talk about this last class, so it's not like this is brand new, right? Uh, we said that the power would have to go up by one, right? And then to offset the three coming down when we take the derivative, we'd have to put a one-third out here, right? Remember that? That would be an antiderivative. But we also talked about that you could always add a number to this, right? Plus 1, minus 5, whatever. But that is, that is an antiderivative. And there is a whole infinite, what I call them, a family of functions that would qualify. Yes? So that's an example for you. Now, capital F of x plus C, capital C, is called the general antiderivative. So even though we know that there is an infinite number of functions that would qualify, if we just write this plus c, that covers all of them, right? And so that is the general antiderivative. We good? So that's just some language. Now let's get some notation. When I say notation, that just means how we write things, symbol, using symbols, right? So some notation. If I'm going to ask you to find the antiderivative of a function, I could just write out, find the antiderivative of the function, here's the function, right? 
But that kind of becomes a pain in the butt to have to write that out each time. So we have a shorter way of writing all that out. And we use this symbol. All right, so this symbol, imagine that symbol as being an S that's been stretched out, all right? And hopefully you'll learn a little bit more about this um, when you get to Cal 2. They'll talk to you about what are called Riemann sums and how it is that, or why it is that we use this S stretched out. And it actually comes from the idea of the letter S and the S standing for um, the Greek symbol sigma, which represents a summation. So somehow, some way, the antiderivative is connected to adding things up. But that's further into Cal 2, all right? I'm not going to get into it in this class. For now, we're just going to look at that as, as a symbol that tells us to find the antiderivative. So this is saying, all right, find the antiderivative of the function f of x, right? Simple enough? There's one additional um, part of this that gets thrown in that we put next to it. And it's, it's almost like a multiplication here. We put this thing dx. Now, dx for us, because again, I can't get too far into Cal 2 right now. I want us to look at dx as just being the symbol that represents what the variable in the problem is. So this is what we call the differential. And it's telling us, it lets us know x is the variable. I should say independent independent variable. So your function depends on x, right? Your function is a function of x. And this just verifies that x is the variable in the problem, all right? Can you just take that OK and swallow it and be OK with it? Yes? Pardon? Yes, you could have, you could have this symbol finding the antiderivative of a function that depends on more than just x. It could be a function of two variables or three. Um, and then you would, you would need to know which one, which one you're treating as the independent variable. And that would be Cal 3. But this is going to have a more important, um, it's going to play a more important role than just being a placeholder, as we'll see today. All right? <clears throat> OK, that all right? Now, the, um, this elongated symbol out here, this elongated S is called the integral sign. Integral sign. This is the differential, which keeps track of the variable. The function that we, that we are trying to find the antiderivative of is called something also. And you might recognize this when I tell you what it is. Do you remember when we had square roots, <clears throat> what we called the thing underneath the square root? The radicand, the radicand. yes, radicand. This is called the integrand. It's the thing you're trying to find the antiderivative of. Now, if it is possible to find an antiderivative, if it is actually possible to do, because not every function you can find the antiderivative of, um, if you're able to, and let me erase this and write something else. So I'm just, because I wrote all over that, I'm just going to get a fresh, clean um, start with that. So. If, the, if it's possible to find the antiderivative of this, then that should be equal to its antiderivative, right? And that we call capital F of x. And if we add the plus c, 
that takes care of all of them, right? That, that covers all of the antiderivatives that are possible? Yes? So <clears throat> this, of course, is called the antiderivative, right? That's the antiderivative. But um, this process, the process here of finding an antiderivative, of going from here to here, is called something. Now, going from taking a function and differentiating it, right, like is what we did in Cal 1, that was called what? Differentiation. differentiation. And so when you're doing Cal 2 and you're going from a function to its antiderivative, it's called integration, right? So this process is called integration. And you will spend a lot of time in chapter, I believe it's six. Chapter six in Cal 2 is called Techniques of Integration. So it's the entire chapter is dedicated to the techniques that we use to actually integrate functions or find the antiderivatives. That means the same thing. Right? So if I say to integrate a function, I'm saying to find the antiderivative of the function. Right? With, with more um, terminology and notation here, this C is called the constant of integration. You will always have a constant of integration when you find the antiderivative of a function. You'll always have the constant of integration. You have to, because there's a whole family. Let's see if I'm missing anything. I think we're good. So let's, let's get down to the business of, of just chipping away small little chips off of this whole process, because you know, like I said, it's, it's an entire chapter in the book. A very intense chapter. We're just going to kind of get our, our feet wet here. So let's start with an example. And what we're going to do here is try and come up with what's called the power rule for integration. And I'm going to, I'm going to start this by reminding you of what the power rule was for differentiation, not integration, but derivatives. So recall that in Cal 1, if you were asked to find the derivative, that's what that prime mark meant, right? Find the derivative of x to the n, it was n times x to the n minus 1, wasn't it? And that's where we got the whole idea of the power coming down and subtracting one from the power, right? That's what we did. But now what we need is to see if we can come up with the rule for instead of differentiating x to the n, integrating x to the n. So our goal here is to try and come up with a formula for this instead. So we want to find the antiderivative of x to the n, treating x like our variable. And we already kind of talked about this last time, right? We did? Just using some new notation. We said that we know for sure the power on the x is going to have to come up by 1, right? So we know that that's going to have to be n plus 1. And so when we differentiate this to get back to that, that n plus 1 had to come down. And we don't want it to be there. So what do we have to put out here to kill off the n plus 1? 1 over n plus 1, right? So we have to multiply by 1 over n plus 1 out here. And this is a number, right? Someone gives me a number like uh, if this was x to the fourth power right here, then this would be 1 over 4 plus 1. That'd be 1 fifth, and that would be x to the fifth, and the 5 would come down and cancel out, right? I'm only missing one thing. And I'm plus, c. plus c. I must have my constant of integration. Do you agree? That's the power rule? That should work? Should. There's one case 
where it doesn't, though. Can you see where it wouldn't work? Look at this over here. What, what is the one scenario over here that this formula would fall apart? When n is negative 1, right? If n is negative 1, that formula is going to fall apart because then you're going to have division by 0, won't you? So I need to put a little note here to the side. This works if n is not negative 1. <clears throat> so it's a good formula, but it doesn't hold for one particular value of n. It does not work. So let's investigate that, that one scenario. What if I was asking you for the antiderivative of x to the negative 1 with respect to x? So you hear the way I say that? With respect to x. Well, what is x to the negative 1 rewritten? Like drop it down. 1 over x. Now just think about what we've learned in this class. Can you think of something that when you take the derivative of it, you get 1 over x? The natural log. This is the natural log of, and now what we're going to start to do is we're going to use for the antiderivative 1 over x natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. And the reason why we do that is because the natural log function is not defined for negatives. So we put the absolute value there to cover that so that we don't ever get a negative in there. And then I put the constant of integration. So when we combine these two together, we have a way of dealing with all powers of n, don't we? If n is not one, negative 1, we do this. If n is negative 1, then it's just natural log of, of absolute value of x. So that is the power rule. So I'm going to write it down all summarized, all right? So here it is. Get rid of that. The power rule says for, for integration, that if you're trying to integrate x to the n, there are two possible outcomes. So I'm going to use a brace to represent the two outcomes. This is either going to be equal to 1 over n plus 1, x to the n plus 1 plus c, or it's going to be equal to natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Those are the two possible outcomes, right? It'll be this if n does not equal negative 1. It'll be this if n is equal to negative 1. That's it. Pardon? There's only one case where it happens. That's right. But we just need to be aware of it because if we forget about it and then later on we're trying to use the formula, all of a sudden we're getting division by 0. Right in here, you know, that should remind you, oh, wait a minute, there, there was another, there was a way we got around that. Okay, so let's now see this power rule in action in, in a specific example, all right? And I'm going to start, my first example is going to be very, very basic, and then I'm going to give you something a little more challenging. So how about this? What is the antiderivative of 1 over the square root of x? So can I use the power rule here? Yes, as long as I can rewrite this as x to a power, right? Can you rewrite that as x to a power? Well, it's 1 over x to the positive 1 half, right? That's what the square root means. But that does not yet look like this, right? When I write this, where's the x? Top, right? It's not in the bottom. That's what the power rule requires, that our x is on the top. So you've got to move that x to the uh, 1 half up. So it's actually going to be x to the negative 1 half dx. Now you can use the rule, right? And we're going to use, this is not the natural log case, right? 
So n in the problem here is what? n is negative 1 half, right? That's what n is. So now just apply the rule. So when I apply the rule, watch what happens. I'm actually taking the antiderivative, right? I'm actually going to find it. So the integral sign is gone. Because the integral sign says, go find it, I have now found it. Also, the dx does not come with us either. So this is more like a placeholder than anything else. You know? So just find the antiderivative of that. It's 1 over n plus 1, negative 1 half plus 1, x to the n, negative 1 half plus 1, plus some constant. And then you have to start adding fractions. And you're going to have to, we kind of got good with fractions when we were doing derivatives a little bit. Now you're going to have to be really good with fractions to do antiderivatives. Um, those two together, Three, one, half. one half, one over a half, two. flips and becomes two. So this is two, x to the one half plus c. But what is x to the one half? 2 root x plus c. Now there's some good news when it comes to antiderivatives. What do you think the good news is? You can find the derivative and make sure it's correct. You can check your answer, right? As long as you can take a derivative, you can check your answer. So if I were to check this answer, I would take the derivative of this. I'd cover up the 2. What's the derivative of root of something? We've been through this a million times. 1 over 2 root x. What's the derivative of a constant? 0. And then I still had a 2 out here, right? And those 2 cancel. And I get 1 over root x, which was the integrand. So it checks. <clears throat> All right. Yes? All right, let's try something else. I like to give problems like this on tests. x squared minus 3 um, square roots of x plus 5 cube roots of x all over x cubed dx. So we're going right into the, to the fryer here. Now, your instinct might be to realize that each one of these are powers of x, right? x squared, this is x to the half, this is x to the third, this is x cubed. So your instinct might be, I'm just going to do a power rule on each one. But you have a, a quotient, don't you? And we don't know how to undo a quotient. We know how to take the derivative of a quotient, don't we? And we know how nasty that gets. Undoing a quotient is even worse than trying to differentiate a quotient. The only thing we know how to do is take the antiderivative of x to a power when it's just that x to that power, you know, to a power by itself. That's all we know. But fortunately, the way I presented the problem to you, I gave you a single term in the denominator and three terms on top. And that allows you to split this into three fractions, doesn't it? Okay. So I'm going to do x squared over x cubed, that's the first fraction, minus 3x to the half over x cubed plus 5x to the third over x cubed and then dx. So that's a, that's a legal move right there, right? And now we're back in college algebra, and we're just using properties of exponents. If you have x to a power over x to another power, you subtract the powers. So here we're going to go 2 minus 3, which is negative 1, right? So I'm going to have what's the antiderivative of x to the negative 1? minus, now what do we get here? You have to do 1 half, <clears throat> take away 3, 
which is 1 half minus 6 halves, so getting common denominator, and negative 5 halves. So I'm going to have minus, I'm going to have a 3, and then I'll have x to the negative 5 halves. You all still with me? Plus 5. And now I need to do 1 third minus 3. So 1 third minus 3 is the same as 1 third minus 9 thirds, which is negative 8 thirds. So negative 8 thirds. And that's it, right? dx. And don't forget to write the dx. Don't be like, well, you know, I'll pick that up later. You know, I'll remember that later. You need to just get into the habit of always having the proper notation. Uh, oh, whoa. Forgot the x. I, I don't know why I put that. It's 5x to the negative 8 thirds dx. I'm, I'm here I am um, lecturing you on proper notation. I'm forgetting the x. Okay, we good with that? Now we've run into something we haven't seen before. We actually have three separate terms, right? Terms are separated by addition and subtraction. Back with derivatives, if I was, if I was taking the derivative of this, could I do the derivative of each one individually? Yeah. Yes. So guess what? With antiderivatives, it works the same way. If, as long as it's addition and subtraction between the terms, you can find the antiderivative of each term separately. All right, now the way that that looks written out in a more um, concrete formula way would be this, and this is in the book. If you're trying to find the antiderivative of f of x plus or minus g of x, so if you have two functions that you're adding or subtracting together, you're trying to find the antiderivative of those, then you are allowed to split this into two separate integrals and do them individually, as long as it's addition and subtraction. If that's multiplication, well, that's chapter 6, okay? That's when you get into the heavy stuff. All right, so because of that, because I'm allowed to do this, I'm going to split this up into three integrals and do each one. <clears throat> but I'm not a fan of writing three integrals, okay? What I do is I just do each one. Just do each antiderivative right now. So let's, let's do this one. What is the n on this first one? The n is negative one, right? And that was that one case we, we had to use the natural log on, right? So the antiderivative of this first piece is what? Natural log absolute value of x, right? Now I'm supposed to put plus c, right? And then for this one, when I do that one, I'm supposed to put plus c again, which I don't know what that c is. And then when I do this one, plus c. So I should have like three c's, right? But when you add three constants together, it's still some constant. You don't know what it is, right? Do you agree? So at the very end of the entire problem, I'm just going to put a C, and that will account for all three Cs, since we don't know the value of any of them. All right, so this one, let's be careful with this one. This is going to be negative 3, because why am I not doing anything to the negative 3? Why am I ignoring it and bringing it with me? It's a constant, and that's exactly what we did with differentiation, right? If it was a constant attached to a function, then we brought it with us. If it was a constant by itself, it was zero, derivative. So same thing uh, with the antiderivative. If it's a constant attached to a function, we bring it with us, and then we just do the power rule on this. So n for us here is negative 5 halves. So what I need to do here is times 1 over negative 5 halves plus 1, x to the negative 5 halves plus 1. I'll work that out in a minute. What next? Plus 5 times 
n for us here is this, right? So 1 over n plus 1 x to the n plus 1 plus some constant. And now it's, it's fun with fractions again. What's negative 5 halves plus 1? Negative 3 halves. What's 1 over negative 3 halves? Negative 2 thirds. So we have natural log x minus 3 times negative 2 thirds, you said? x to the, and we already did that a second ago. That was negative 3 halves, wasn't it? Can we just say that's positive? Yeah, we will. I'm going to go one more step. So this is negative 3 halves up here. The number out here, if you haven't noticed this already, is always what? The reciprocal of this number. Because 1 over n plus 1 is the reciprocal of n plus 1. So plus 5 times, now here, negative 8 thirds plus 1, negative 5 thirds, flip it. Negative 3 fifths, x to the negative 5 thirds, plus c. And now I'll clean up everything here. I've got some multiplication to do. Natural log of the absolute value of x. These threes cancel. A negative and a negative is positive. So plus 2, x to the negative 3 halves. And then these fives happen to cancel. And that'll become a minus 3. Minus 3 x to the negative 5 thirds plus c. And that would be OK to, to say that's our answer. But we should also be comfortable um, converting this over, like dropping these down as, you know, for positive exponents. So you could say natural log absolute value of x plus uh, 2 over x to the 3 halves minus 3 over x to the 5 thirds, and then plus c. And you could even go further than that and convert these into, from um, rational exponents to radical notation, right? And then clean those up. But at that point, it's just algebra. So, we okay with this? Yeah? All right. <clears throat> so, there are a few other functions that you need to, or a few other um, antiderivatives that you should just know because of where we've been with Cal 1. Um, yes? The life of derivative is the integral, is it a limit as well? Yes. Yes. So here are some more examples. And we did do these last time. This you just have to know, right? You just have to know it. There's no like, we're not going to have any rule, like the power rule, to go backwards from that. You just have to know from Cal 1 what the derivative of sine is, right? Derivative of sine is cosine. So this is just sine x plus c. You should also know what the antiderivative of sine is. And this one is a little, little tricky. It's got to be negative cosine. So just think about it. If you put cosine x plus c, would that work? What's derivative of cosine x? Negative sine x plus 
negative sine x, and that's not what we have here, right? So we just put a negative in front, and now the derivative of this would be that. So be careful with that. In Cal 1, the derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. In Cal 2, the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. The antiderivative of cosine is sine. What are some other ones we should know? Secant squared x. So you have to know that the derivative of something gave you secant squared. What was it? Tangent. The derivative of tangent x was secant squared x. Do you all remember that one? Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, you should know all the derivatives of all six trig functions. Derivative of sine is cosine. Cosine is negative sine. Derivative of tangent secant squared. Do you remember the others? Do you remember what the derivative of uh, secant was? Secant x tangent x. So that means I could actually write this down. Secant x tangent x, right? dx, that antiderivative should be secant x, shouldn't it? Secant x plus c. What was the derivative of, of, um, of cosecant x? No, cosecant, it was, it was negative cosecant x cotangent x. So watch, if I do this, cosecant x cotangent x dx, the antiderivative of that is actually negative cosecant x plus c. Now, look what I did with the sign. The derivative of cosecant x, the derivative of this, is negative cosecant x cotangent x. So the antiderivative of this without a negative would mean I have to change the sign over here on this side. There's one more that would cover all six trig functions, and that's the derivative of cotangent, which is negative cosecant squared. That's the one I think you might have been thinking of. So that means the antiderivative of cosecant squared x is negative cotangent x plus c. So I, had, I have to pick these very careful, right? If I'm going to go backwards, I have to be careful how I pick this, don't I? Mm -hmm. Like I have to be sure that that's the derivative of that like before I could go back. Like if I just picked randomly, uh, I don't know, what's the antiderivative of tangent x? What's the antiderivative of tangent? Well, the, what, the derivative of what was tangent? We never had that, did we? We never had something that when we took its derivative, we got tangent. Right? So what is it? I mean, we don't know, OK? Stay tuned to Cal 2, and you'll, we'll figure it out. All right, some other ones that we should know. E to the x, dx. E to the x. E to the x plus c. That one you should recognize also. How about this? Ooh. Uh-oh. OK, good. You're on the right track. So what? Yes? I'm putting a star next to this. This comes up a lot in Cal 2. I heard inverse and I heard tangent. That's exactly what it is. This is arc tangent x. Now, we talked about the inverse trig functions, didn't we? Please tell me we did. And we took the derivative of the inverse trig functions, didn't we? Mm -hmm. And 
that was the derivative of arc tangent of x was 1 over 1 plus x squared. We also had um, inverse sine and inverse cosine derivatives. And so let's see if I can pull those out of the memory bank. 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared dx. That was, that right there is the derivative of arc sine. So we have to recognize that this is the derivative of this. And uh, arc cosine is plus. That's right. Square, right. Yep. Arc cosine doesn't come up that much in Cal 2 for some reason. Arc sine and arc tangent do come up a lot. All right, we good? All we have right now is if I give you something with powers of x, you have a way of doing it. Other than that, it's got to be something you recognize from Cal 1, right? Now, who has their formula sheets? Anyone have their formula sheets with them? The ones that you're allowed to have on the tests? If you have them, break them out. I'd like to introduce you to page, reference page 6. Do you have reference page 6 on there? Title of reference page 6 is Table of Integrals. I want to point out to you that right now we have done number 2, integral u to the n du equals 1 over n plus 1, u to the n plus 1 plus c. And I, they put in there what? n can't be 1 or negative 1? You see that? That's the same exact thing we just did, but instead of using the variable x, they're using the variable u. All right? We have also done number 3. Does everyone see that number 3 is the case when n is negative 1? When they write du over u like this, what they really mean is 1 over u times du. And they just slid the du on top, right? And the antiderivative of that is natural log of u, absolute value of u. Have we done 4? Yeah. Yes. We have not done 5. Have we done 6, yes. 7, yes. 8, yes. 9? 10, 11, 12. Now, I didn't tell you what the antiderivative of tangent was, right? But I told you that, you know, stay tuned. You don't need to stay tuned. There it is. It's natural log of secant u. That's what it is. I want us just to appreciate that for a second. All right, formula 12 says that the antiderivative, antiderivative, the antiderivative of tangent x should be natural log of secant x plus c, all right? That's the formula 12 with me replacing the u's with x's, right? Mm -hmm. How could I check that this is true? The Take the derivative of this. Forget the c. Derivative of natural log of something? One over, something. One over it. What's the derivative of the inside? What's the derivative of secant x? Secant x, tangent x. Right? How would you have known to do that? Right? There's a way. Okay? I'm going to show you right now. We're going to do it. Because we can do this one. The last thing I'm going to show you this semester is what I'm about to talk about. Will allow us to get, will allow us to, get to this answer. But does it seem like it's kind of a far stretch to get to that right now? I mean, now that you see it, like the derivative works out perfect, doesn't it? But it seems pretty difficult to just go back from here to here. All right, so here we go. Uh, I wanted to finish looking at this. Um, 13 we haven't talked about, 14 we haven't talked about, 15 we haven't talked about, 16 we did talk about 16, except there's a slight change in that formula. Instead of 1 minus u squared, they're using a squared minus u squared. So don't worry about it. If a is 1, it's the formula we just talked about. Same with 17. 
If you look at 17 and replace A with 1, it's the arctangent. And then who cares about the rest? There's a bunch. But look, if you follow, continue down formulas 21 through 29, and if nobody tore out the tables in your book, you actually have another page that goes to 46, another page that goes to 62, another page that goes to 95, and there's a total of 120 integrals on this table of integrals. And I've seen, I've seen books that thick full of, of integral formulas. A lot of those formulas come from using the techniques of integration that you're going to learn in Chapter 6. It's where a lot of those formulas come from. And in, in my Cal 2, we do, we do prove a lot of those formulas. Not, we, keep, we don't do all 100 and something of them. But you know, we show that those formulas don't just like fall out of the sky. Like we get them from somewhere. Um, <clears throat> but the idea is you don't want to, Cal 2 is not about memorizing a table. That's not what it's about. The table's there as a reference for the easy stuff. The harder stuff you have to work through. All right, so let's talk about our last topic in here, and which is called integration by what's called substitution. Often referred to as U substitution. And I refer to it as U sub. So if you ever hear me, for those of you who might be taking me again for Cal 2, when I say U sub, this is what I'm talking about. And, and when I, in, in Cal 2, I will start from scratch and in, in, I'll talk about this like no one has seen it. So you get to preview it before, all right? So here's the idea. I'm going to start with, uh, I'm going to start with, how about we do the tangent one, right? We know what the answer should be, right? Natural log of the absolute value of secant x plus c. So how does integration by substitution work? Well, th here's the method. I'm going to tell you what the method is, all right? This method, what we do is we try to find or try to see, okay, we try to see, looking at our integram, we try to see some function and its derivative. I'm going to look at, I'm going to look at my integral, I'm going to look at the integrand, I'm trying to see if I see a function and its derivative both sitting there staring at me. Okay, if I do, if so, let u be equal to the function. So there's, there's two things I'm trying to identify with u substitution. A function and separate from that, it's derivative sitting there also. If I see that, I'm going to let u be the function and then have fun. That's all I'm going to say. All right, here we go. You look at this. Do you see something in its, and its derivative? I don't. I see tangent x. The derivative of tangent x is secant squared x. I don't see that. Do you? Okay. But what is tangent by definition? It's, it's sine x over cosine x. So would that be the same thing to write it like that? Yeah. Now do you see something and its derivative? Yes. Yes? What do you see? Do you see a function and its derivative? Okay, so you see sine x and you see its derivative is cosine x is there. Do you see it? You see something and you see its derivative. Good. 
That's what we need for U substitution. But you could have looked at it a different way. You could have said, I see cosine, and its derivative is what? Negative, Negative sine. No, I'm off by a sign, aren't I? But being off by a sign, is that going to be a deal breaker? I don't know. We need to talk about that. So you could look at it two different ways, right? Something in its derivative or something in its derivative, but we're a little bit off. Yes? OK. Let me come back over here to the method. I want to add something into this that was just to kind of get us going. There's a couple of things we want to be aware of. <clears throat> Don't let derivative be trapped inside a function or in the denominator. Now, I'll explain what I mean by this in a second. And also, the other thing I want to add to this, it's OK to be off by a constant. OK, so let me try and explain this now. Let's go back over here and look at this again. First, we had to be clever enough to realize tangent is sine over cosine. Then we looked at it and we said, hey, yeah, sure. I see a function sine. I see its derivative is cosine. We also said we see that cosine, the derivative of it, is sine, but we're off. Yes? Now, now I'm telling you, don't ever let the derivative part be trapped inside of something or be trapped in a denominator. So if I come over here and I were to say, look, I'm going to say that this is my function. Where is its derivative? in the denominator. And I want to avoid that. OK? I want to avoid that. Also, I'm saying that it's OK to be off by a constant. So if I were to look at this as being my function cosine x, the derivative of that is what? Negative sine x. I'm off by a constant, right? Off by a negative sign. That's OK. All right? So following those two things in blue there, I have to see a function and its derivative, and I'm going to make a substitution right now. Everywhere I see the function, I'm going to replace it with u. All right? OK, see if you can follow me on this. I have to erase this. <clears throat> so here comes the u substitution. To the side of the integral, I'm going to write down what my substitution is. u for us, what are we going to use? What's the function that we're going to use? Is it sine or cosine? Cosine. Why not sine? Because the derivative of it would be in the bottom, right? We want it the other way around. We want to take cosine and the derivative is up top. It's OK if the derivative is up top. That's, that's what we want. We just don't want it trapped somewhere where we can't get to it. All right, so u is going to be which one? Cosine. cosine x. Now, what I've done is I've created an equation, right? There's an equation. What I'd like for us to do right now is take this equation. I'd like for us to differentiate this equation implicitly with respect to x. What? I mean, take the derivative of the left side, du dx, and take the derivative of the right side. What's the derivative of cosine x? Negative sine x. But then you have to go in and take the derivative of what's inside. What's the derivative of what's inside? One, because dx dx. All right, so does everyone agree with that? No questions? If you have an equation, we're perfectly, it's perfectly fine to differentiate, differentiate an equation on both sides, right? As long as you do it with respect to the same variable. So that's fine. Now watch, watch me. What do I do here? Got this dx out of here by basically multiplying on both sides by that. Now I'd like for us to come back to our problem, all right? The whole idea behind u substitution is to make a substitution. I haven't done that. 
I recognized something happening in here. I went and did some work over here. And now what I'd like to do is come back to this integral. And I'm going to start to peel this apart, all right? Sine x dx, you see that? These are both living in the numerator, aren't they? And do you see sine x dx right here? OK, so watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to write 1 over cosine x times sine x dx. That's the same problem, isn't it? That's the exact same thing as this? Yeah? Sure? Right here, I see sine x dx. Right here, I have sine x dx. But I had a negative, don't I? I was off by a sine. How could I make this side of the equation not have the negative? Multiply, Multiply both sides by negative 1, right? So wouldn't this become negative du equals sine x dx? OK. And then down here, cosine x. That is this, right? Agreed? Yeah. I would like for you to rewrite the entire integral now. Replace the red with this. Replace the blue with this. And tell me what the integral would look like. What would it say? Integral. 1 over u, one over u so times negative du. negative du. Agreed? Now this negative is like a negative 1, isn't it? And that negative 1 is like a constant. And the constant can come outside of the integral. I don't have to pay attention to it. <clears throat> just like when I was taking derivatives, I don't have to pay attention to it. I just need to bring it with me for my answer. Agreed? Yes? So this should equal negative integral 1 over u du. You all still there? Yeah? I'll leave that up here. And do you know what the antiderivative of 1 over u du is? Uh, ln, u. ln u. This is power rule, isn't it? This is u to the negative 1. We're using u instead of x now. See, what we've done is we've taken a problem that originally started with x, we've converted it to a problem that has u in it, and it's a much easier problem, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So now this becomes, do I write the integral sign? No. no, it's gone, right? Negative natural log of the absolute value of u plus a constant. Right? The antiderivative of this is natural log of the absolute value of u. But there was a negative in front. Yes? yes. Uh, so we don't pretty much know more about du, not right there. So it looks like you're leaving the du. Well, the derivative That's the is biggest there. issue students have when they first see this. Remember what this, you're trying to find the antiderivative of that, right? Yeah. The du is more like a placeholder. But is it important? Absolutely important. It was important when we were doing the substitution, right? We had to replace the sine x dx with exactly what it was over here. Right? So it's more than just a placeholder, but when you go to take the antiderivative, don't worry about it. Okay? The integral sine goes away, the du vanishes, you write what the antiderivative of, of that is. Some students like to, you know, even though it's not correct, they like to say the du turns into the plus c. Just so they don't forget about the plus c and they don't worry about where that went, even though that's not what's happening. All right, we good? What was u? Cosine x. U was cosine x, wasn't it? So we're almost there. Negative natural log of cosine x plus c. Is that what we had on our formula sheet? <coughs> no. What was the answer on the formula sheet? It was just natural log, right? Not negative natural log? Ooh, did we mess up? Properties of logs. What can you do with a number out in front of a log? Yeah. 